Thank you for listening to Nomad's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Yes. Jesus. What the? This is the way we came? It's been one road we've been on the well, entire time. We've been on No, 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 no! What is happening right now? Watch out! She said that the people on this island made a deal with a demon. right now demons and sea creatures you never should have come back here no, 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 no. No, no, no. place is evil is anybody there you know. don't be frightened dear can't let you go miss it's quite beautiful you know the island Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 437. Release in June 10 on Shudder is Off Season, a supernatural thriller in which a grieving daughter returns to a desolate island hometown to investigate the mystery of her mother's death and its connection to the colossal shadow that looms over the island. Written and directed by Mickey Keating, Off Season is a beautifully crafted and performed horror film that holds a firm grasp on its audience who are drawn into the film's mist-filled world. And joining me now is one of the stars of Off Season and a prolific filmmaker in his own right, Mr. Joe Swanberg. Joe, I thank you so very much for your time today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's really interesting, um, Joe. Like I said before, you yourself are a prolific filmmaker and also an actor, and, and you've you know you've delved into horror before, both in, in both facets. He, with Mickey Keating, though, it's really interesting just reading about his preparation for this film. He pretty much storyboarded and pre-edited this whole kind of movie even before any, anyone kind of went to set. Is that something that you've actually had experience with before where a, where a director kind of like already had the, the film kind of mapped out to such an extent? Um, and having said that, is that type of pre-preparation something that, I don't know, gives more room for yourself as an actor to kind of delve into your character? Yeah, it was interesting. I, I have not had much experience with that. I think Mickey is a more, more formalist and a little more prepared than um, certainly the mumblecore world that I came out of, you know, where a, a loose and um, open kind of structure is how a lot of us work. But I, um, Mickey um, came to me from the beginning saying it's okay to improvise. You know, I, he was um, kind of structured a lot of Jocelyn and I stuff in the beginning to have um, room for us to build those characters. and. Um, with the driving sequences in the beginning, it was very open. Um, so I felt it was a kind of nice mix of those two worlds. I mean, as an actor, there is something comforting about the director knowing exactly what they want. It definitely makes it um, easier to step in and um, get very specific notes and direction on that stuff. But also uh, coming from a very improvised and sort of loose background, I was happy to know that I... Um, had the freedom to do that, that it was not going to be just a very technical experience of hitting marks and being robotic. You know, Mickey was, I think, really excited to open that up. So I had a really good time. I mean, I feel like we eased in with a lot of loose stuff and then um, my scenes got more technical as we went. So it was a good, um, good kind of flow for me. 
you play the character of George, who's the partner or ex-partner, perhaps, of, of Jocelyn's character, um, uh, Mary. Um, in the movie, it begins with you two in the middle or near the tail end of, uh, I think it's like a couple of days' worth of car ride uh, to, to this um, uh, island community. Is it true that, like, you had a chance yourself and Jocelyn to kind of step back, work in a whole kind of backstory as to exactly who these people are, where they're coming from, and exactly what they were actually talking about just before the film kind of begins? Yeah, we were. Jocelyn and I were able to get together in L.A. I was out there um, for some work, so we were able to grab lunch, and um, we had both read the script by that point and could um, talk about uh, a little bit of backstory. And then also Mickey created a lot of space for us when I first got to town to um, talk through what exactly those days must have been like. And also you get a sense of it in the film. I mean, we're, there's tension between us. It's unclear where our relationship is. It's kind of been um, left off back in New York. And then we've had this long drive together. You get the sense that maybe we did not talk very much um, on the way down. And so it was a really fun, rich um, character environment to jump right into. And also I've known Jocelyn for a long time. She um, started my friend Ty's film, The House of the Devil. So we got to um, meet on the festival circuit a little bit and then would run into each other over the years. So it was also great to know that I was going to be um, coming into the film, working with someone who I already knew was comfortable with, liked and um, so we were able to kind of push each other's buttons and play around with that a little more. I think than if I was um, meeting somebody brand new and needing to form a relationship. So all around, it was a really nice um, working environment. And I love backstory and character stuff. I mean, for me, when I get to act in something, I'm happy to fill the hole and do whatever the director wants. But um, when it's meaty and rich like that, and when we got to improvise a little bit, I was having such a good time. When it comes to other aspects of your character, the external of him, you've actually said that the wardrobe was a really kind of big kind of beneficial thing uh, to this movie. Yeah. How important is that for you to kind of get into your character, that kind of external kind of part of a, of a, of a character, especially, you know, you know, we'll talk a little later, the weather conditions in Florida at the time weren't very kind to you. Also having that wardrobe control yeah. would have been very beneficial. <laughs> Yes, and I'm naturally a sweaty person, so taking oh, me um, too. Me too. Hot, right. hot weather and putting me in a, a thick um, wool, you know, jacket and stuff was brutal. But um, no, it, it 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 was so funny. I mean, I guess it's like um, natural that changing your look is going to do something psychologically. But it's so interesting how little things like wearing a wristwatch, which I, I never wear watches in my normal life wearing glasses in this film, which I've never worn glasses before. The the little routines of putting these things on and um, kind of going through that structure was like a nice organic way to um, do the transition. Like, okay, we're shooting now. I'm in character. I'm, I'm in these clothes. I'm in these little accoutrements that I don't have. And um, they're reminders throughout the day. I mean, they, they give me little things to play with. I'm a fidgeter by nature. And so... It's interesting. As soon as there's a watch on my hand, I, I'm doing all these like um, mannerisms I don't normally do with glasses. My character smokes. I don't smoke. So I, I loved it. I mean, it, it, it's not. Um, yeah, to me, it's like uh, if it's a crutch, it's a great one. You know, it's nice to um, actually feel different and feel like I, I'm embodying someone else as opposed to I mean, in my own films, often when I'm acting, I'm wearing my own clothes and I'm playing almost exactly myself. So there is a huge kind of nice transition to, to really be like, okay, I'm playing a character this time. This is not me. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by 80s Tees. 80s Tees is an online retailer of licensed t-shirts and pop culture gear from your favorite movies, TV shows, cartoons, video games, comic books, and musicians. Celebrate your inner 80s nerd and click on the link in the show notes below to get the raddest retro t-shirts delivered to your door. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Loot Crate. Founded in 2012, Loot Crate is the worldwide leader in fan subscription boxes. Loot Crate partners with industry leaders in entertainment, gaming, sports, and pop culture to deliver monthly themed crates, produce interactive experiences in digital content and film original video productions. No matter what you geek out about, Loot Crate has a subscription box for you. 
to get your very own exclusive collectibles, apparel and gear delivered to your door, be sure to click on the link in the show notes below. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Tee Public. Tee Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, Tee Public is sure to have something you will love. To me, George acts in a certain way as kind of like a, a conduit for the audience. He's saying what we're saying yeah. a lot of times, which is get out, stop what you're doing, don't go there. Don't do this. Yeah. What the hell's going on? Did you actually feel that as well when you're playing the role? Yeah, I, I I like that. I mean, for me, I want characters to be smart. I want, I think um, horror films are scarier when characters are making good decisions, not dumb decisions, you know? So for, for me, like I'm often uh, imagining like, how can we make this function even if the characters are doing everything right? You know, they're, they're making the right decisions. They're asking the right questions. They're not getting themselves into unnecessarily bad situations, and yet horrific things continue to happen. So I was always definitely talking with Mickey and um, trying to embody that, trying to ask, like, what would I really be doing? I mean, if I were down here and my girlfriend were telling me this, what questions would I be asking? Mm -hmm. What would be going through my mind? And if there's room to fit that in, then I'm always pushing to make the characters more grounded, more relatable. And um, yeah, to me, it increases the tension. I mean, you, you care about them and you don't get to roll your eyes and think, oh, why are they going into the abandoned factory? You know, they should not be going in there. But when you have a character who's saying out loud, why are we going into the graveyard? We should not be going in there. Um, you know, it, 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 it does do something psychologically for me. It makes the movie more fun to watch and kind of um, takes me along for the ride a little bit more. I read that you said in regards to horror movies, and this is from an interview like 19 years ago, that you find horror to be like a better fully earned movie experience because of kind of like the group participation that comes along with it. What do you remember for yourself as, a, as an experience watching a horror movie where you kind of felt in that kind of communal group participation thing? Because I find the same thing. When I've seen movies, horror movies, yeah. whether it's with friends at home or in the cinema, you can't help but kind of, because the fear kind of projects like this, your inner voice to come outwards, right? And it kind of works away. Do you remember having an experience yeah. like that when watching horror movies? Yeah, you know, honestly, my favorite um, communal experience like that was at Sundance when VHS had its world premiere. Right. Because the film made, like, um, so many of us did different segments of the film, and I had not even seen the other segments. So it was that amazing experience of, like, okay, cool, I'm here watching my own film, but also I've only seen one of the five pieces of this film. And um, so, you know, it's like... Uh, I don't know, somewhere midway through the movie, I just remember having this feeling of looking around the room and thinking, man, we are all just on this ride together. Like, I don't know what's going to happen next. I have no idea what the next segment is going to be. Everyone's like laughing and screaming around me. It was just so awesome. Such a great, um, dreamy movie going experience. And um, I do think horror is kind of the only thing that comes close to that you know there's like something about filling a room with tension and then you release the tension and then you build it back up and you release it again you just start to get the most interesting reactions from people i think um laughter is like such an awesome part of horror films i love to be terrorized and to feel scared but also because of that you often get laughs as big as the biggest comedy mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah they're, they're they're like um and and you know the other thing is horror films get to be political in ways that um political dramas are often hacky and they feel preachy or something you're kind of like oh, all right now i gotta listen to the filmmakers politics for the next hour and a half but there's something about horror that it's like a more sneaky way in to comment on society to be satirical without you know kind of devolving into that zone so mm -hmm. i i just think it's such a cool genre. i mean there, there's just so many um directions it can move in all of which feel comfortable in the horror space but you know so much broader than um, a kind of narrow scary zone that i think people think of final question so when i was doing my, my research on yourself in the movie i found this kind of interesting tidbit where last year you actually had kind of like a hole in the wall kind of like video 
store where you're renting out VHS, your VHS copies yeah. from your collection. Um, you know, I just found it yeah. so fascinating. So just say that video, video store was still happening right now. Um, and I just watched off season and I wanted to look at your video collection and want to find something similar to that. What kind of movies would you recommend for an off season fan in your video collection uh, that I could rent out with a pizza that night? I think that off season, the best like off season double feature would be um, Carnival of Souls and um, Harmony Kareen's The Beach Bum. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I, that's what I would recommend someone watch if they wanted to like um, get a, a full scale sense of the movie um, without watching the movie. And I know Mickey, those are, those films are both close to Mickey's heart. Um, but it was so funny when I got to Florida and was asking him like, what are the references? What are the influences? Carnival of Souls is a sort of obvious one, you know, yeah. it's got the uh, connection, but he just kept talking about the beach bum too, which I thought was so funny. Um, and kind of perfect. I mean, that's like, um, there's Mickey's Keating's brain right there, you know, mm -hmm. like Car Carnival of Souls and the Beach Bum mashed together. It's a great answer right there. And uh, for everyone out there listening, off season, releasing June 10 on Shutter, I really recommend people check out this movie. If you want to see a great, moody, creepy horror movie, off season is the movie for you and Joe Swanberg. So terrific in a movie. And I thank you so very much for your time today. Um, I know you're a busy man. Congratulations with the film. And hopefully we get to talk again in the future. I really enjoyed our talk today. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.